Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. You've been given the key. The front door creaks closed to lock you in for the first time. All is well in your new home until odd things begin to happen. Whispers from your child's room. Secret conversations with someone who isn't there. The discovery of bricked up tunnels that hide the footprints of nightly visitors. From shape-shifting horsemen on dusty reservation roads to ghostly children giggling in the woods, we explore the reality hidden just beyond the veil. So lock the windows and draw the blinds and turn down the lights as we present to you, curious listener, strange but true tales of the inexplicable and the unknown. Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. jury. Close your door. What's the uh, inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, magicians are demons, specters, spirits, Spook, sleep paralysis, strange disappearances, sky whale phenomena, yes! alternative history, shadow people. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. It. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. 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 Well, hello, hello. Hello. How's it going? It's going pretty good, John. How are you doing? I'm good, Jeremy. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Chris? I'm I'm pretty fantastic. And we are your hosts for the show. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Believable Podcast. Welcome back. Yeah, today's gonna be fantastic. Creepy fantastic. We're getting into the Halloween season, right? We yeah, we just recently did a listener stories, a strange listener stories episode, but we were feeling very much that because we are Headed towards the uh, Halloween time. That's kind of like the best time to have spooky stories. Yeah, I, I think. think people really enjoy the listener stories. So it's, you're getting your fill. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. It's a 360 win. Yeah, as we're coming closer and closer, inching our way ever closer to the bottom of that veil that's lifting up for the All Hallows Eve season. Like a little trick-or-treating inchworm. It's getting closer and closer. Okay. I prefer a tree worm. Tree worm? That's not a thing. Isn't it? I think they're the same thing. Silkworm? Really little green things. Those are, aren't those silkworms? Silkworm. I think they might be the same creature anyway either way it sounds like something i don't want to be around it might be the same creature <laughs> it sounds they do look like babies of them mm-hmm. or something they have the same color like yeah. the same kind of vibrant tropical green look yeah you're making them sound very appealing they are what are you guys talking why about <laughs> john, john couldn't make it today do you hear he has tree worm i don't know what you're talking i'm just about. saying it sounds like a gross kind of thing you don't want mm-hmm. you know what else is a gross thing you don't want <laughs> what chris bring it back to the to show live in a haunted house <laughs> I don't know if that's gross. I think it's it's tragic. It can be gross. Well, you get my point. It's tragic. It's gross for the soul. It's a harrowing experience, and it's certainly, like you said, John, it can be tragic. It can be gross if it's an unkempt house. That's true. Ghosts thrive in the mess. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. There is something to that. Dirty places. Uh, I feel oh, like actually, we're calling out people that send in these stories that they have dirty houses. Dirty, <laughs> that's not what I mean at all. I was dirty thinking. places attract spirit races. Yes, and scared faces. Okay. No, uh, there's something about, well, obviously dark corners, dark places, but specifically when we did the gin episode, I thought that was interesting with gin, which is like a, basically a catch-all for paranormal activity in that world. They live in like bathrooms, like dirty bathrooms. I think you might be able to get away with a that. clean bathroom, but just basically dirty unkempt places, they kind of thrive in that chaos and that mess. Um, we aren't sure why exactly, but it's just an interesting kind of uh, thought coin. Okay. Well, we definitely have a lot of stories about haunted houses today and people's experiences growing up in these unusual dark places. And we also have some more bizarre, off-the-wall kind of stories that I found. We do have a uh, story of a shape-shifting horseman off the reservation. (laughs) There's that story. That's really weird (laughs) and kind of awesome. I saved that one. I didn't listen to it. So I would be surprised. I want to get your reaction to it. We got a, a really interesting kind of um, someone lost a friend suddenly. And oh, yeah. There's like kind of an intervention. I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, that's a good one. That's the one that you said you came up with the title for? 
The reluctant messenger. Yeah. I, my title for it was the phantom shift. Where that's, I used to work, that's what you called a shift that you picked up for somebody else. Yeah, I don't like And that. also it's a play on words because it's a phantom. Okay. Yeah, but it's good. And um, we got man in the mirror. We got haunted mirrors. We've got children in the woods luring other children in the woods. <laughs> Ew, that's creepy. Yeah, cool. So if you have any stories, we've said it quite a bit, but... Definitely send, go to is it believehole.com. That's our website, John. <laughs> and, uh, but that's the speak pipe button is on the website, right? Yeah, I think there's a button at the top, but also at the bottom of every page. There's a contact form, and on the right side is a submit your listener story. It'll take you to a page where you can share your paranormal experience or whatever crazy story you have. They can either write it in through the contact form, or they can use the speak pipe button to record a voice message. And you can upload your own voice recording if you really want to and email to us at brothersbeautiful.com. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the highest quality. And if you do record, just keep in mind, like I think most people do a pretty good job of that, but be inside, it helps. And if it's really like a noisy room, it can deteriorate the quality a little bit. If you can get to like a quiet place, it yeah. definitely helps. Yeah, for sure. Or if you can find a spooky payphone in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> that would be the best solution. <laughs> so if you guys haven't heard your stories yet and you have submitted it, uh, hang in there. If they don't get on the show, they will be in our listener stories archive. But either way, we'll contact you and let you know. Yes! So thanks to everyone who submitted and uh, we hope you enjoy the stories today. We do. And just a reminder, all of these stories today are allegedly true accounts from our very own listeners. So we ask you to keep an open mind and give them the benefit of the doubt. And an open heart. An open heart. Hold on to your butts. <laughs> That's good. Write that down. That's good. That's great <laughs> writing. I say that way too much. Hold on to your butts. I know. I do too. That uh, quote from Jurassic Park has made a lot of mileage on this show. It's yeah. still one of the best quotes ever. Hold on to your butts. You can tell when someone's of a certain generation by the, the certain film quotes they use. Uh -huh. Were you in third to sixth grade in 1993? <laughs> Jurassic Park. All right, here we go. You guys ready for our first tale of terror and intrigue? What story should we do first? Well, uh, that's a good question. We have underground tunnels and deadbolt doors. Just pick one. You don't have to go through them all again. Okay. <laughs> we just set them all. What do you feel like doing first? Let's do the man in the mirror. Yeah, let's do man in the mirror. That's a really interesting one. This comes from Austin Gage. This happened about 20 years ago in McMillan, Michigan. And I'll let the story speak for itself. It's a pretty weird, creepy story. Hit it. This happened to my great uncle when I was a young child, and the story has been corroborated by multiple family members several times throughout my life, so I'll try to retell it the way I always heard it. But fair warning, I'm not sure how much has been exaggerated because my uncle does not like to talk about this at all. So my uncle's wife at the time was really into occult and witchcraft, and she would supposedly summon different spirits. My grandparents told me she would refer to them as her friends. It started small, with toys moving themselves or operating without batteries. Their kids were pretty young at the time and would tell my grandparents and father that they were afraid of her and that she could do things like place her palms flat on top of the table and lift it off the floor. I'm not sure what caused the worst of it, some sort of family drama, or maybe the divorce, I think. But one day, my uncle was sleeping on his couch, and something grabbed him. He looked up, and this guy with the flannel on was pulling him down the hallway by his hair. This thing was manifested enough that he was able to reach up and hit it, at which point it dropped him. When he stood up, it was looking at him from the other side of a mirror that had hanging up at the end of the hall. This mirror supposedly had a couple stick figures drawn on the back. After this, he would sleep at my grandparents' house, and when he was home, he would just sit on the couch with a shotgun, staring at the mirror. I'm not sure why it stopped, or if it stopped when he moved away. But around this time was also my first encounter with a shadow person, which I'm not sure if it was related or not. Fast forward about 10 years. He's remarried, new child, and almost forgot about the incident. One day he gets a random phone call and voice message out of the blue. Tuesday, 2, 51 p.m. And this I heard, which is partly how I found out about these events. The voice message had a lot of static and you couldn't really make out what was said. 
what you could hear was a woman's voice saying something about, quote, which shook him up for a long time after. Yeah, creepy. Yeah, dude. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like how do you a respond full to that? manifestation yeah. that pulled him by his hair. A physical apparition that could actually grab so him. That, that's him. his uncle's story, so it's not his first-hand account. Right. But it does sound like his uncle was like very disturbed by it. Yeah. The stick figures in the back, there could have been some sort of like witchcraft or... Mm -hmm. Well, mirrors are common tools in yeah. not only witchcraft, but also in um, looking good. No, I was going to wow. say something real there, and I totally fell out of my brain. Ruddy man. <laughs> man. Let's talk about that. Um, in a, like a cult practices. Occult practices. Cult yeah, absolutely. And not even just magical rituals or occult practices, but also just in cultural beliefs, it's a global idea. And it makes sense on the face of it, too, if you think about it. when there's something that exists that shows a reflection of everything that you're existing in, you can see how psychologically your mind would go to, like, is there something real in there? Right. Oh, yeah. Right. Mirrors are very weird, even just looking at them, like, in mm -hmm. general. Yeah, have you ever stared into the mirror, into your own Look eyes? Look in your eyes? Oh, that's Especially really... if you're maybe on, um, you've had well, we a drink, or, you know what I mean? And, and just general, in general, right. like, if you really just stare at yourself and just see into your pupils, it's a window into your it's soul. It's very unsettling. It is a little unsettling. Hello, John, you see me, I see you. You're looking at yourself that you never do. Yeah. On a daily basis, in a way that you can, you can look at your arms, your legs, but you look, to look at yourself with your lookers... With your peepers. Well, even looking at someone else into their eyes is uh, Yeah, it gets strange. weird after a while when yeah, you're staring, you know? You're like, what's in there? Yeah. I'm going to take it. The eyeballs are weird, but yeah, mirrors definitely, I mean, you have the seven years bad luck to break a mirror. You have mirror rituals. You know, what's that one we used to when we were kids? Well, scrying. Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. And then, of course, scrying with Dr. John D. We talked about it a few times. He um, used a scrying mirror to communicate and pull through the language of the angels, which he called Enochian right? The milky and magic. Basically, you're looking at a dark mirror, right? A black mirror. Is it say. like the dark web? It's exactly sure. not like that. <laughs> it's exactly not like that. I mean, you could make some sort of abstract comparison, but, but the idea was, at least when, what John D would do, and then later, I think Crowley did this a little bit, but when John D was looking at this, and when, when he was deciphering this alleged Enochian language, this language of the angels that he and his friend were trying to basically develop this idea of Enochian magic by looking into this dark mirror. Mm -hmm. And they would see, the longer you looked into this, they would see figures or they would, that's how the communication would begin. So the black mirror has become a pretty popular tool in occult practices, in seances. It's called scrying, scrying yeah. mirror. He worked for uh, Queen Elizabeth I the first, I think. He's also kind of the reason we have libraries. Mm -hmm. He started one of the first libraries, I think. In yeah, England. we did a, a decent deep dive on him last season. I forget him which and his episode. cohort, Ed Kelly, who was a convicted criminal. <laughs> well, yeah, he had some con <laughs> artist background, so there's some, uh, you know, question. Yeah, no, no, I was just saying that because he, the, his whole story is interesting. Some fascinating characters that are tied up with the John D story. Right. People he worked with. Yeah, the, Ed Kelly was a character of ill repute and, you know, do you trust? Because I think a lot of the communication was happening through Ed Kelly. So was he a con man mm -hmm. or was he not? But that's where the Enochian language comes from that we supposedly have today. Uh, I don't know if you can ax if you can gain access. I know there's a grim war, I think, mm -hmm. that he wrote, I think, about the Enochian language. Anyways, we're spiraling off into a conversation that really will feed into our expansion episode. If you guys are expansion members, you're in for a treat, I think, mm -hmm. because I researched for this episode. That's so gonna be great. So this is on witches? Yeah, so it's going to be on I had a kind of a title going, uh, Words of Witches and Dark Charms of the Occult. <laughs> Or something to that effect. But essentially, I'm going to be... It's going to be kind of like... Did you see Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Did I see the movie? Yeah. Yes. Familiar with Keanu Reeves? Not in many, many years. With but... the work of Keanu? Wait, what? Exactly. So what I want to do is pull in... I have this amazing book called The Encyclopedia of uh, Witchcraft and Wicca. Um, Rosemary Ellen By Rosemary Ellen Guiley. And I was reading through just kind of getting ideas. And I thought it would be really fun to grab different kind of characters, stories, charms used all throughout witchcraft, whether it's from Africa, ancient Babylonia, modern day. Of course, you have to mention Salem Witch Trials. But there are so many different elements, characters, and pieces going around that it would just be really interesting to have kind of a grab bag of the witch and witchcraft. Try to get a kind of a basic understanding of it throughout time by looking at some really interesting, just unique kind of elements. Yeah, different characters in different cultures, right? Right. And there's and there's tools that were used by different types of people. There's good and bad. It's just a fascinating conversation. Some fascinating uh, lore and stories that we're going to get into there. Tis the season. 
but it's going to get great. It's going to get spooky, and it's going to be freaking fascinating. So tune in for that, guys. If you're not an expansion member yet, you can go to beliefhole.com, click on the expansion button. Access granted. And uh, we'll see you there. Get in there. <laughs> so yeah, anyways, thank you, Austin, for that story that triggered our conversation about the expansion and the witchcraft. But yeah. I'll be avoiding the mirror for a while. Yeah, definitely interesting story. It sounds like your family, it's been kind of carried down. I think those are the best stories when you have some family corroboration. And yeah, and to speak to what you said, John, about the stick figures on the back, it's always unsettling the idea of finding something that is not supposed to be where it is that indicates oh, a yes. curse or just something that you find that someone placed for a secretive purpose, a clandestine purpose. That's, you know, like when you find a chicken bone above the door frame, like it happened to mom and dad, like that's a witchcraft sort of thing. When you find a figurine under your bed or something, right. you know, that someone put there. Or a grigri on your doorstep. Right, which we'll, I'm sure, get an expansion. Grigri yeah, that's, right, that's but, from the Voodoo of New Orleans, but yeah. The intention, when you find just a hint that there's some dark intention. Or like a beheaded deer statue, like in your cabin on the second floor. Yeah. <laughs> Man, if that happens to me again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's continue down the line here of this spooky situation. All right, guys, strap in. This next account comes to us from Robert Drock from Oklahoma City. This is a pretty fascinating experience he had throughout most of his childhood, it sounds like. And they all started when he moved into a creepy stone house in the country when he was four. And here's his story. In 1991, our family of eight moved to an old stone house in Rochester, Indiana. This house was creepy inside and out. To paint the scene, it had always reminded me of the Amityville house with its one facade bearing the two windows on the second floor that almost resemble eyes. The house was on 21 acres in the country. In front of the property was a quarter mile plot we used for farming. A long quarter mile driveway stretched along the field leading up to the house. Next to the house, we had a barn and pens for our various farm animals. Next to the pens, there were several acres of woods. For the first few weeks that we lived there, I slept in the upstairs living room on the couch. Every night, I would hear loud, heavy footsteps coming from the bathroom, walking into the living room, past me, and then into my parents' bedroom. When I would open my eyes to look, there would be no one there. After that, I would close my eyes tightly and pretend to be asleep. I didn't understand what was going on at the time, being that I was only four years old. From the time that we moved in, several members of my family experienced strange paranormal activity. My brother Nathan was the first. Late one night, he got up to get a glass of water from the kitchen. As he walked through the living room back to his bedroom, he saw our old rocking chair moving back and forth on its own. Another night, he and my oldest brother, who shared a room, were woken up by the sound of their bedroom door handle being shaken violently. It shook over and over as if someone was trying to get in. They were both too frightened to open the door to find out what or who was on the other side. The next morning, they both asked the family members who was trying to scare them the previous night. Who was trying to scare us last night? No one knew what they were talking about. Please don't do that again. At the bottom of our stairway, there was an old furnace that we used to heat the house. One night during the winter, our mom came down to put more wood in the furnace. As soon as she started, she got a feeling that she was being watched. The feeling intensified until she finally turned around to look. Behind her, standing toward the bottom of the stairs, was a teenage girl with long blonde hair in an old-style white dress. The apparition stared at her, not in a menacing way, but in a way to say, Hello, I just wanted you to know that I live here too. She looked back quickly to close the furnace door, and when she turned back around, the girl was gone. Our mom only told that story once. She never talked about it again. To this day, if I ask her about it, she only says, I'm not sure what I saw. On another occasion, my sister Shayna woke up around nine in the morning on a Saturday and found that she could not move. She screamed out for help. Help, 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 someone help. A few of us kids ran into the room. She told us that something was holding her down and that she was scared. My oldest sister thought she was making things up. The rest of us were just confused and didn't know how to help. Shayna continued to scream and cry for help. Us kids were all too scared to touch her, as we could all feel an evil presence in the room. Eventually, the presence left, and she was able to move again. 
Since then, I have learned about sleep paralysis and figured that's what it might have been. Recently, I asked her about it. She told me it was definitely not sleep paralysis. She felt strong hands on her arms and ankles holding her down. Her room had been at the very top of the stairway. I remember that every time I had to go upstairs by myself, I'd feel a strong and evil presence. I hated it. Coming down the stairs alone, I would run down the stairs as fast as I could and jump off the last few steps. Shortly after, the paranormal activity stopped. However, several years later, when I was around nine, they started again. By this time, some of my siblings had grown up and moved out. The only ones that had happened to have had run-ins were me and my sister, Lizzie, who was a year younger than me. When it returned, it first took residence outside. My younger sister and I would occasionally hear children playing in the woods. We'd hear laughing, giggling, and sometimes crying. The houses in our area were spread out, but I did have a friend next door that had a few siblings around his age. We figured it was my friend with his brothers, although he had never gone on our property without being invited. We figured it had to be them. We would run into the woods to go find them, but the woods would be empty. I asked my friend a couple of times if he was in our woods the day before, but he always said that he wasn't. My friend wasn't the most trustworthy, so I wasn't sure if he was lying or not. Each time we heard the kids' voices in the woods, we would run in like always, but never found anyone. During another occurrence of hearing the kids playing, we ran in again, hoping to catch my friend with his brothers. Again, no one. But this time, it felt like someone was watching us. Hello? I yelled out over and over. Is there someone in here? A few seconds later, we heard footsteps walking through the fallen leaves to one side of us. We quickly turned to find no one. Then the realization set in that my friend was telling the truth. He hadn't been on our property. Something unseen had been luring us into the woods far from the house where no one could see us. We ran as fast as we could out of the woods and back to the house. The next time we heard the sound of children beyond the grave, we didn't dare enter the woods. Soon, the experiences once again began inside the house. I had my best friend Craig over to stay the night once and we were sleeping in my older sister Rachel's room. We were laying in the dark when we noticed the room got a little lighter. My sister's closet had sliding doors that hung on a track at the top. The sliding doors were swinging out slightly and lights were shining from the inside of the closet. The lights were moving like tiny balls of light flying around inside the closet. We were both scared and fascinated as we watched. This happened for about 10 minutes before the lights went away. We never told anyone the story, thinking no one would have believed us kids. The crazy thing is, I recently asked Rachel if she ever experienced anything paranormal in our house in Rochester, as she had never shared any stories before. She said that one day she had a nightmare, that she went downstairs to the living room, and she saw the rocking chair moving by itself. The next morning was that morning that our brother Nathan had said he saw the chair rocking when he got up to get a drink in the middle of the night. Then, she told me that she used to see the lights coming from inside her closet. I instantly got chills. I had never shared my story about the closet with anyone before, and neither had she. The last experience I had in that house was in 1996. I woke up early in the morning, just as the sun was rising. I opened my eyes to see the young girl in the white dress floating in the corner of my room, staring down at me. I slowly pulled the blanket over my head and pretended to go to sleep. After a few minutes, I gathered up enough courage to peek out. She was gone. <laughs> Pretty crazy. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Wow, it sounds like a lifetime of... Uh... At least in that house. Pretty much. Some people have a series of lifetime stories. Mm -hmm. And that seems all connected to the house, right? Specifically, like mm -hmm. all the engagements or the property with the woods. Yeah. I like that kind of, I mean, it's nice to have that in-family corroboration when you have the mother seeing the girl with the blonde hair 
right. and years later, he finally sees it. Even with her hesitancy, where she's like, I don't, I don't know what I saw. Yeah. Well, yeah, it sounds like she doesn't probably want to relive it either. Right. So was there any backstory on the house as far as like deaths or? He, oh, there is a backstory. It was a slight backstory. So the one thing we left out of the story, he said that something else started happening outside. You know how he said eventually the activity went back in and that's where they saw the lights in the closet. Yeah. Which is so bizarre. But also before that, something else was occurring outside before that activity moved back in. And it was this bang that would happen, like a, a rhythmic bang in the forest. And it was every time that he had to close the door to the chicken coop at night oh, no. and deal with the chickens. And it would happen every <laughs> time that night. And he kept telling his parents about it and they didn't believe him. And then finally one time his mom came out. And of course, when she comes out, the noises stop. And then he gets her to come out one more time. He's waiting and he's going out there and then finally the noises go and he turns around and he's like, see, I told you. And of course she had gone back inside. Of course. So it was playing with him the whole time. So it's like a prankster spirit kind yeah. of thing. And uh, the little bit of history there is that he ends up going over to his friend's house like a week later and his friend's father said, you know, I've lived here my whole life and the man who built that house died before he could complete the project and he died on the property. Oh, wow. So unfinished you know, he business. maybe it was him still trying to finish the hammer house. away. Who knows? But, yeah. What a good story though. Uh, if fascinating stuff, again, like the floating girl, always creepy when you've got a girl floating in a, in a white gown, but the white gown, very but, common. But subtle. You know, this is better than all the movies that like have her oh, hair over the face, walking upside down. Or like moving fast. The frame rate's really quick. And, you know, <laughs> right. no, but this is very uh, creepy, but in a realistic kind of way. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's nothing too out there. It just yeah. has that unsettling tone of, connectivity throughout the family and their different experiences, but it's centered in that location and the, the woods with the, the children. I wonder yeah. where this is because I heard a story a while back. Rochester, New York. Okay. I wonder if that's where this was. I saw a video. I don't know if it was a documentary series or maybe a paranormal cops show or something, but I remember the story of this, might've been on our bell, this police officer basically. Oh yeah. They would get complaints about people in, people in the woods, like yeah. kids playing in the woods. And the police would go and there would be nothing there. And he was convinced finally, I think he actually saw an apparition at one point. It's like, okay, this place is haunted. And they just never went back, but there were actual reports to the police. Mm -hmm. and the it was police, a regular thing. Yeah. yeah. But so that's interesting. It'd be fascinating if that was the same mm -hmm. general area. But John, you made a good point about the story. It does bring to mind Tim Marchenko's work. Oh yeah. Disembodied voices. Like, are these in fact childlike spirits or is it something that's, you know, trying to Calling lure? you into the woods. Right. That might not be anything like that. Or so maybe something darker. For sure. <laughs> okay, this next one's great. Uh, I titled this one, The Horseman Cometh. Uh, it's a very serious topic, the uh, horseman. And horse shifting in general is a pretty serious issue. So uh, <laughs> it's I, a real problem. I have some corroborating information on this. It's a short story, and then we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit. But uh, please, John, this is great. This comes from Shane. I was driving towards a reservation in New Mexico, and I swear to God, I saw a horse on the right side of the road. As I passed and got closer, it was then a man about five foot six. But the crazy thing was, it looked at least seven, eight feet tall as I was approaching. I'm in a lifted truck, so I have a good kind of top view of everything, and that just scared the shit out of me. The craziest part is I fucking hate horses. <laughs> they scare the living shit out of me. That's and funny. That just was really kind of disturbing because... Um, that would be. It was a horse. I saw four legs. I saw a big rump. I saw a big tall head. And then right as I was passing it, five foot six man. So what the fuck? That's why you don't pick up <laughs> um, hitchhikers. And I was about to hit record on my phone but i was in like such disbelief and i kind of got scared and i didn't but i really wish i did but holy crap um yeah you gotta watch out when you're on the reservations out here thank you shane yeah. so awesome so he, he saw a horse with a with a man face he saw a, ho like a horse body no initially he saw a horse okay initially he saw a horse he's driving his lifted truck near the he reservation saw, like the rump and you know the rump, the horse got that nice rump, and yeah. then they got the shoulders <laughs> and the head. And then as he approached it, it basically becomes a man. It becomes well, a man. Well, he sees it. So it's not like a, what are those things called? Like a minotaur? A chimera? No, a centaur? Yeah, like where it's like a, it's a centaur. A yes, centaur. Man body with a horse no, body. No, no, no. It man. is more like this. <laughs> 
what? these fellas here. <laughs> it's that. So it that was, would be horrifying. Oh my it's gosh. Like, it's like Dogman. Like the one on the left is like Dogman, but scarier. Yeah. Because there's like a intense sexuality with horses. For there he is. There's what a weird. What are you talking no, about? This is a thing that Look people. Look at that thing. Yeah. <laughs> he's ripped. What's that intense sexuality? There is a connection with the ladies and horses. That's what? why you see. There's a lot of romance novels based on shape shifting horses. What? I've looked this up. Found this when I was looking for shape shifting horses. I don't know many women who read uh, shape shifting horses. Maybe it's because they're material. strong and silent. Yeah, it, they are. And you can ride them and they're very dependable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and of course, there's like a connection you get, even men, of course, get with horses as far as like, I mean, it's sounding really weird as I'm saying it, but basically, like the cowboy, the horse was like, it was punished by death if you steal a man's horse or kill it. And you can't eat horse meat, but you can eat cow meat. There's a connection. They're like small land dolphins or whales. Small well, land how you're land going, dolphins. I don't know. Yeah, I know what you mean. And they're also like kind of like they're romantic. You know, they're like yeah. robust. Like the like a lot of romantic story settings like back in the West, you know, like... <laughs> robust. <laughs> I mean, did I say the horses were robust? Yeah. They are robust. Yeah. But they're just like, it just reminds me of like firemen, you know, like... like <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're I mean, saying. Like it's a weird it's men a weird that ride horses. I would think for women are like attractive. You know, they're like the, like the Marlboro man, like the masculine yeah, kind like of thing. Like just that masculine stereotype. Also, horses are just they're fit. They're in shape. You know, yeah, they are. About a horse compared to a cow. They're muscular. This was a guy. I have a picture in the show notes here. This was he was a cross country runner who which had turned in wanted to be a fast runner. So, but then she tricked him and turned him into a horse. There's a great picture here what? of a cross country runner who is in mid horse transformation. Which is terrifying. Are you? Is this real? Is this a story? Is this a real picture? About? This is a thing online. Here's another one of a man mid mid horse shift. Uh, He's turning ew. into a man or turning, turning into a horse. horse. That's okay. pretty awesome. There's I actually have audio of it too. But there's this guy. You what? can you can sign up for his Patreon, and he will give you like special transformation images and audio. Wait, is he the horse that He's, transforms? There's like a subculture. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. This guy will give you images and audio of transforming. Of mid transformation. Yeah, I have his. Uh, what are, what are you notes. talking about? It's like a kind of a subculture. You know, people are in all kinds of things. Here's another great one of a cow. Obviously, our project. What does the audio sound like? He's talented as far as visuals. His name is White Flame K. Uh, I do have a clip of the audio, actually. I wasn't planning on pulling it. He just it up, records like himself. He makes them. He kind of sound designs a transformation of an animal to okay, a human. Okay, so he's doing like sound design? Yeah, essentially. And But he can sell them to you. So he's into like body what horror. What a weird... It reminds me of like The Walrus. Or was, oh, what was that movie? yeah. With the Kevin Smith film. Yeah, where he turns that guy into a walrus essentially. So he sells it to... Okay, weird. I still don't get the audio part though. I think he just makes the, what it would just sound like if there was a horse transforming into a man. Or... Into specific. So there's a whole subculture of people that are super into this. There's a subculture for everyone. Are we going to get flagged for this? Do you guys like the show so far? <laughs> I love it. I'm not talking to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Burning, what, what the f*** is going on here? Oh, sh that burns. Oh, it feels like it's drying out and getting buffer and changing color. What the f***? Oh, what the f*** are those? It's poking out of my skin. And they're hard and sharp like... Oh, like, uh, uh, almost fine. Uh, okay, so it continues. Wow, we're going to have to bleep a lot of that <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, so <laughs> that that might be turning into a dragon. I'm not sure which example that was. Okay, so this was all from, this guy saw a horse man. Yeah, so I just, I wanted to know. You like a little corroboration? Yeah, I want to do some corroboration. <laughs> <You're getting that laughs> this corroboration. doesn't count. Sorry, Shane, I know this doesn't really count as corroboration, but, you know, he's on the reservation, or out, I don't know if this happened outside the reservation, but it was near the res. And he, <laughs> I guess it's not corroboration. But there is the Skinwalker, of course. Mm -hmm. And Skinwalker, you can, I think, yeah, you're a shapeshifter. You don't have to turn into anything specific. Right. Skinwalkers, you think wolf, dog, dog man, but it can be anything except, of course, sheep. That's illegal. Right. Tribe law, I believe. Maybe because it's a food source. I'm not exactly sure. But of course, you have the puka. There is instances of shapeshifting horse entities in different cultures. The puka is an Why Irish is one. familiar? Oh, okay. Okay. It's the Irish one. It's basically like a shitty Uber. Uh, for drunk people, it can give you a ride home from the pub at the end of the night, but it will oftentimes basically just the the water, terrify right? you. No, that's a different one. I think that okay. might be the Selkie, but this one just causes all kind of havoc and mischief. And he's not, I don't think he's a terribly dangerous entity, but there is the Puka's Day, which is the day after Halloween. So oh. well timed, where when the farmer harvests all his corn or whatever crop he has, he'll have to leave some for the Puka. Interesting. Yeah. So they'd be out about this time of year. But the real, specifically accurate shape shifting horseman that sounds like what. Not that he saw this specifically, but is the Tikbalang. I'm not sure how you say it, but it's the Philippine horseman. And this is this image here, John, on the left. 
first one you saw. This is actually like a, a mythological creature, a, a cryptid, whatever you want to call it, in their culture, and it is a shape-shifting, horse-headed, scary, scary thing. Yeah, it looks pretty terrifying. I doubt that he saw that, because that's in the Philippines, unless there's maybe an immigrant who came over and is still shifting into this shape mm-hmm. in the reservation. It's possible, okay. most likely. <laughs> okay, shut it down. I just want to end it by saying he's afraid of horses. It's a pretty common oh, fear. Yeah. Equinophobia. Oh, is a hybrid word, one that is composed of roots of different languages, derived from Latin equus, or horse, and Greek phobos, fear. Like equestrian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think horses are creepy. I mean, they're very, very powerful. There is something ominous, especially like you put it in a horror setting like The Ring. Remember that film where there's the horse Mm -hmm. that is on the boat and I think kills itself? All animals like that can be kind of creepy. Even Mm -hmm. like a cow can be creepy. There's those big eyes. It's the big black eyes, you know. But the horse has that extended strange face. Yeah. I think that's really Even like feeding them when I fed them, it's it's kind of like their mouths are so big they can just chomp your hand. And they have human looking teeth. I think that's part of it too. That's true. There's that uncanny valley there. So thank you, Shane, for that really weird experience. Um, I like that. It was unique. You got to watch out for the reservation. There can be some shifts. You might have some reservations on the reservation. That was a terrible pun. (laughs) Thank you, John. All right, guys, when we come back, we'll be doing underground tunnels and deadbolt doors, and we'll be doing the messenger from the other side story that John spoke about earlier, and maybe one or two others. We'll see you in a sec. Boop. Hi. Hello. Welcome back to some spooky stories from the belief hole. There we are. That was a disturbing banshee call. I like that one. Oh, that, you know what? Is that a sign? Should we do the banshee story next? We could. That's a pretty uh, intense story. Change up the vibe a little. Yeah, let's do this next. I thought this was really, um, it's a fascinating story, a little tragic. And this, I think, will sound kind of similar or familiar to us guys personally. Some of the notes in here might remind you of something that happened in our family. This is called The Banshee of Glenshee, and this comes from Dave in Ireland. Hi guys, I stumbled upon your podcast about two months ago, and I've since listened to all the episodes. I even got my wife listening. Thank you, Dave. I wanted to tell you of a paranormal experience I had a few years back. I had recently moved from home and was out for a walk in the woods with my then-girlfriend, now wife. It was 11 o'clock in the morning and a nice day. Whilst walking, we started hearing a wailing through the trees. It sent shivers down my back. When we looked in the direction of the sound, it moved behind us. Then we turned and the sound was behind us again. It started getting closer. As the keening grew to its crescendo, a man with a dog walked around a bend in the path. The wailing instantly stopped, and the man didn't seem to have heard anything. We ran back to the car. My girlfriend was a mess. I had a feeling to call my mother, and she sounded scared. In the folklore, the Banshee only cries for people with certain names, usually ones that start with O or Mac, and relations of the soon-to-be departing will hear her. After I finished talking with my mother, I decided I'd drive back home the next day to check if everything was okay. When I arrived, my mother was raving and hallucinating. I rushed her to the hospital, and she was diagnosed with a stage 4 brain tumor. She never came home again and died shortly after. My mother told me that she knew the Banshee was crying for her, This experience still rattles me a bit to this day. Found out later this patch of forest was called Glenshee, or in English, Glen of the Fairies. Thanks again, guys. Yeah, thank you for that story. Very personal story. Yeah, it's really interesting when you hear stories that are of a kind of folkloric nature to a specific region and then having people experience that. In mm-hmm. such a personal way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating to do the show and get gin accounts from the Middle East, from people who are living mm-hmm. in the Middle East, and, and then Banshee accounts from people who are living in Ireland. Yeah. Really interesting. And uh, it makes me wonder about paranormal entities or whatever you want to call them out there, things that are 
culturally specific to certain regions. And we talk about like, could there be something that's not just lore in a region because it's a group of people, but also because that's where things are geographically Mm -hmm. in some other realm. Well, this is like a harbinger sort of situation. Yeah. An omen type thing to warn you. I think it's, yeah, it's kind of almost like a sort of helpful in a way. You know, it's, it's not bringing, you, I guess. Yeah, it's not bringing about the demise of someone you care about. It is letting you know that it's going to be happening soon. Although I'm pretty sure it's not something that you can prevent. Well, and it's strange too, because it is similar to the Mothman. Or people have made that connection that the Mothman is a harbinger of mm-hmm. doom with the Ohio River and the bridge collapse, but also an entity, like a physical cryptid type thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be cryptid. Well, cryptid in that it's a non-identified animal. It's a cryptozoological why, creature. Why, why do you think it's an animal, though? The banshee specifically? Yeah. I don't necessarily, but... I think it would be more like a multidimensional, spirit. spiritual. Exactly. But some of these, what we call cryptids, have a multidimensional aspect to them. And I'm not saying... So I'm not trying to say that the banshee is a cryptid, but... Thank you. There is uh, <laughs> Cryptid Four Corners. I think it's J.C. Johnson, Cryptid Four Corners. We talked about his banshee experience in the American Southwest, I believe. Some forest in in the Four Corners area, which is, I forget what states is, are Utah, New Mexico, whatever. Anyways, him and some hikers that he was taking out in the woods encountered what they said was basically like a screaming entity flying through the trees. That seemed more like a cryptid attacking kind of thing, not a spiritual omen type deal. Yeah, the Banshee specifically related to the fairy mounds in Ireland. Right. The dot the landscape there. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of the bloodline too, where they'll specifically Mm -hmm. speak to someone with a name like Mac, like MacDonald or O'Connor. Yeah, there's, the o, there's a very like McLeod. romantic Victorian feel to that sort of aspect to the lore. Very Highlander aspect. It almost seems like they're tied to the family then somehow. Could be. Like the yeah. lineage. Well, and that's the thing yeah. too when it comes to, well, not the same thing, but witchcraft, for example, uh, there is a type of hereditary witch and that's kind of how witchcraft was passed along in different traditions throughout time. Yeah, right. It was more through blood and tradition than it was like joining a, officially joining a coven. Right. Which would still make sense for the elites today. Exactly. And then some of those that are some of those that are covened into it, like, you know, Bill Gates. I mean, it makes and, sense. We did our Appalachian magic and it was, you know, you talk about the site and it goes down usually through females, right. the female lineage. Yeah. And that's the thing too. Like when we get into some of the stuff in the expansion, that's going to get into some creepier, disturbing stuff, but all kinds from all various mm-hmm. aspects. We're not focusing on like your cousins in Appalachia who have the site or, you know, your friendly bus driver who joined a Wiccan coven. We're going to get into some other just as real self-identifying witches throughout time, witchcraft that was practiced. It's really interesting. It ranges from dark to light, but it is deep and rich. And you sold me. I'm ready to adventure. At least I'll see you there, Chris. Expansion. Um, I did want to say the Banshee is typically female spirit, female fairy sort of, or at least related to the fairy mounds there, fairy woman. True. And that shape-shifting horse I mentioned earlier, the puka, mm-hmm. they're one of the most feared, even though there's no His record of them freaky. harming. I think it's just because they're scary. And they only come out at night. From what I understand. So wouldn't you if you were half human, half horse? That's true. <laughs> Isn't that so much time in the supermarket? Okay. All right. So our next story comes from Jason Valentine. Reliable and loyal listener to the show. Great story from him. We called Whispers and Witches on Fawn Avenue. My name's Jason Valentine. Me and my son had just moved into this little apartment. This is actually just a few months ago. That my son was really, really, really scared of for some reason. I mean, like, freaked out, like, could not be alone. He's eight years old. Literally couldn't walk to the bathroom by himself. It's a little tiny apartment. It's a little one-and-a-half bedroom thing. He lived with his mom half the time, but when he was at my house, he was always freaked out and was always scared, you know, needed lights on to sleep and everything. Um, well, I found out why, okay? So, <laughs> one night, Logan is asleep, and I hear him... I think he's asleep. I hear him talking. Why can't I tell my dad? And he's talking to something. And I'm like sitting outside the room listening to this. And basically he's saying like, but why can't I tell my dad? Why can't I tell my dad? And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Because I'm, you know, into the belief that there are other things out there and that we can't explain everything and that there are entities, um, good, evil or whatever that we just don't know yet. But this one sounded pretty fucking bad. I didn't hear it, but my son was talking to it. And basically, I walk in the room, and you know, he's like, oh, hey, Dad, hey, Dad. I'm asking him what he's doing, and um, basically, he's like, oh, nothing, nothing. I was like, who are you talking to? He's like, I wasn't talking. I'm like, yeah, you were. And um, he gets really frustrated. He's like, Dad, don't ask me about this. You can't talk to me about this. That's creepy. Like, okay, okay, okay. And eventually, like, I egg him on. I'm like, you have to talk to me about this. What's going on? If you know something, you have to tell me. You can tell me anything. 
like any dad would, you know, because he wants to help his son. And he starts talking. He goes, well, dad, and the blinds in my room go whoosh, all the way up, like really fast. Nothing was around him. There was nothing touching them. And yeah, so uh, that happened. And so instantly Logan starts freaking out and crying and I'm getting more and more worried and you know I'm obviously like oh no that was me you know don't worry about it but he goes no it's not I can see the cord so I'm laying down with him to try to calm him down and he fell asleep finally after about an hour and then there's this weird weird chanting sounds like whispers coming from the closet which actually used to be a like chimney chute that goes all the way down to the basement so in the next couple of days, I started doing research on what my building used to be before I lived in. Well, it used to be a funeral parlor back in the early, it's like over 110 years old building. Back in the early 1900s, it was a funeral home. And I found out also that apparently, I mean, there's, it's a rumor. I don't know if it's actually true that the Mormons in the area burned and hung a witch on the big ass tree that's right outside my apartment. So, yeah. I've burned sage and done all this stuff, but ever since then, I've seen <laughs> really? little shadow people. Um, I got cameras up, and I keep getting these notifications saying there's a face in it, but, you know, you go and do the recording, and there's no face. You know, it might just be a cheap camera, Facial but I keep getting movement mm-hmm. notifications, noise notifications, but there's nothing on the camera, or the camera is just paused. It's just one thing. So... Um, I'm not great at telling the story. <laughs> great ending. Uh, uh, no, you did fine, Jason. Oh, that was creepy. Uh, you had seriously one of the creepiest stories I think we've got. That is a legit evil entity presence, demonic boogeyman, whatever you want to call it, or dark spirit, a burned witch. Specifically, hearing your kid talking to something that's not there and saying, "Why can't I tell my dad? Can I tell my dad?" Yeah. And then when you ask your kid, and they're like. Don't ask me about that. I can't talk to you about that. That's instantly terrifying. And then oh, yeah. actually have that physical activity in the room of the blinds shooting up and then hearing the whispers. Well, yeah, I think one of the creepiest parts is that his son's having this conversation with someone that's not there. And then, of course, he's consoling him in the bed. And then his son finally falls asleep. But he hears the whispers coming from this closet, the chanting sounds, finds out it you know, was the chimney chute that went in the basement. And then to top it all off, he finds out... Yeah that his apartment used to be a funeral home. Uh, Probably one of the most like complete stories of like, well, that's obviously what that is that we've had. I mean, what do you do? Do you stay there? I don't. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) He didn't mention anything like he was... Oh, that's a good question. Oh, he owned the house? Did he say that? It was an apartment. It was a one bedroom, small apartment. Oh, okay. But anytime there's something where you're in a a building that used to be something else converted, it's always Uh like... Funeral home, specifically. I mean, funeral home could go either way, I feel like. More likely to have dead people have been there, though, than like Oh, a house. for sure, but it's not like they died there. No. But you do hear a lot of I stories mean, of it'd be spirits. weird to be a spirit and, like, they get to the funeral home and they're like, yeah, I'm just going to stay <laughs> here. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are some that are lost or connected to their physical presence. At least that's what I've heard. Mm-hmm. That's what they've told me. That's what they've told me, uh, yes. But there are a lot of accounts to people like, well, they, they haven't moved on or they're at the grave because that's where their body is and they never were able to leave that uh, ethereal umbilical cord. That attaches you to your cord. Yeah, attaches you to your body. So they're still attached into the ground. (laughs) I don't think they're physically. Silver cord is attached into the burial. Like if you can see ghosts, there'd be these cords going down. They're just like they can't get it off. It's a terrifying thought. I think um, just some that have moved on. Sorry, Chris. Go ahead. That's okay. I think it was the the Conjuring. Uh huh. The first time I had seen this representation, one of the most famous haunted stories. And I think it might have been the film The Conjuring. But the house used to be a mortuary, and they found out later. But it was one of these where the boy who was the teenager, wanted to live in the basement. It was a weird room, right? And he's down there, and then he starts hearing voices. He starts becoming possessed. There's this darkness down there. They later find out that's where they were draining the fluids from the bodies. That's where... Oh, that's you know, Whether that's coincidence or not, that is something that's often reported. You find out this place was a mortuary or it was a funeral home. For whatever reason, sometimes there is energy trapped there. And it's in a more pleasant way, I guess, you could make sense of it as this is where the last earthly place where all of your friends and family go to think and remember you. Mm-hmm. So I can see how you could get stuck in a kind of positive way that way. If it's not a, a dark spirit, it could be someone who's like, this is where all my friends and family were before everybody went off their own ways. Maybe there is just some something keeping them in that general area. Who knows? Yeah. But the darkness is what's weird. 
And of course, anytime you don't know what it is, it's, you're going to be a little freaked out on what's talking to my boy and yeah. telling my boy not to tell dad. That's the scariest that thing. Whether that's a human you. telling your kid not to tell your dad what's going on or- Either way, secrets aren't good among secrets children. Secrets aren't good. Secrets aren't good. Secrets aren't good. Friends don't make secrets and secrets don't make friends. Friends don't let friends tell secrets. Friends kill friends that tell secrets. <laughs> okay. Secrets keep ships afloat. Because loose lips sink ships. Okay. <laughs> okay, next on the list here. What yeah, thank got? you for that story. Thanks again, Jason. Great story, man. Appreciate you being here, brother. Good tale. This next one is titled Underground Tunnels and Deadbolt Doors. This account comes to us from Robert Allen. If his name sounds familiar, he's had plenty of experiences. We did an account of his before where he had that experience of that thing down in the basement where his young boy had said it eats children and was looking up in the corner oh, of the laundry yeah. room. He was having those recurring dreams of this dark house. I remember that. And then it eventually ends up lost somewhere on a road trip and ends up at this house. Uh, check out that listener stories for his other account, but we'll put how it in are the they show supposed notes? to know? We'll put it in the show okay. notes. Okay. Uh, show notes. <clears throat> so this takes place in Haxton, Colorado. This was either late 2007 or early 2008. And this is his story. The ex-wife and I had moved to this small town and we got a cheap apartment but it was one of those kinds that was converted into an apartment from something else. Hey, look, last story. It seemed normal at first. There was a kitchen and a bathroom upstairs, but downstairs, there was just one big room with a door on each side. On the far side, it led to a large storage room that was under the restaurant next door and a weird tunnel-like hallway that went under Main Street into the basement of either the library or town hall. I don't remember which, but the other door was the creepy one. It was deadbolted and had a chain on it. The deadbolt was sawed off when we moved in. We didn't think much of it. We figured the key was lost or something. But in that room was a dirt floor and the beginning of two hallways going off to the sides. One was bricked off with the exception of a small hole just big enough to look through. We could see footprints on the dirt on the other side but it went back further than we could see with the flashlight. Ew, Just yeah. dark and open. The other way was filled in with a large dirt mound, almost to the top, and I wish I didn't look. There was a random old stone well in this room. It seemed innocent enough, being an old building, but it was unnerving. We had a constant feeling of being watched while living there, and things would seem to disappear and reappear in different places. After a few weeks, it began to get worse. We often heard scratches behind the walls and at the door. We started noticing the chain on the door would be undone, and we knew neither of us had undone it. We were watching TV one night and heard a slow scratching sound and saw the chain being dragged across the slide on the door, unlocking itself as we watched it. We moved out the next day. Ick. Yeah, that was the right decision. I'd be out of there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Robert, for that story. So there is a well in a boarded up room in the basement? Yeah, the lower like living room area, there were two doors that went off. And it was an old building, right? Yeah. So they were boarded up. One was bricked off and they could see through it and it led to a tunnel. And then you had this other one that led to this room with this well. This other passageway, rather. Mm. Well into the ground, where something is climbing out of into your home and trying to get into your house. Well, who knows? But the fact that there's that that deadbolt, and it's just... That's super duper creepy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you hear these stories all the time, and you're like, why are you still living there? But these people made the right choice, yeah. I think. They're like, yeah. the next that day... That definitely gives it more credibility. Not that the other people's aren't credible, but when... That's just how most people would operate. Like, if they saw something that dramatic, they'd be like, I'm out. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not coming back here. Yeah. At least that's because I'm a scared person. There are several reasons to stay. One is you feel like it's going to come with you anyway. I'm really brave. Two, you just don't have the money to leave. And you... yeah, no, I know. There's definitely extenuating circumstances. And then but... there's the people that stay and then set up cameras and start a YouTube channel. <laughs> right. Or an Airbnb. They're like, yes. <laughs> going to get that 10,000 no, subs. No, actually, I, I think I've just heard enough accounts this time that I think if something like that happened... I would consider trying to find out more just because we have a show. Yeah. I'd want to like try to document it. And you had, I mean, you had the Whistler. Yeah. But nothing that would be like this. The Whistler was definitely an intense, 
If that would have kept going, yeah, I wouldn't be able to stay here. That's true. And if it kept bothering Jake, right? I mean, if it kept pulling his tail or whatever, that would have been a little hard to deal with. Yeah, I think it's the one-offs that are easier to like just rationalize, right? Sweep under the rug of your brain. Like you know, we always talk about mom and dad's all the things that we've each experienced there, but there were so intermittent in between years of time. Yeah, yeah. Like if the cup that was thrown at me happened on a regular basis, we would have been out of there. But because it was one we thing- We would have been out of there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Mom and dad have been like, uh, you're yeah, fine, they, Chris. You know, they would have been like, we just got this place. I would have been out of there. I would have been sleeping in the woods. By the way, that's a fantastic name for a podcast of like creepy things. I would have been out of there. Brain rug. He said, no, that's not. You just sweep it under the I brain like, rug. I would have been out of there better. Now, nah, brain rug's a lot more to the point. We made brain a mistake rug? with belief hole. <laughs> now you want to go with brain rug. <laughs> what it's is what you, Chris, it's stuff you sweep under your brain rug. So when you oh, lift it up, there's so, always crazy. It's so much worse it's than so obvious, our show now. But it's so clear. People would see that and be like, brain rug, I know what that is. No, that no one would no, know. No. Are you, you think people would know what that meant? The brain rug. That's, You're that's, embarrassing that's, yourself. <laughs> okay, what's next? Let's do the reluctant messenger one. Let's do it. Oh, this is great. Or as I call it, a phantom shift. Um, I'll mention a little bit more about this topic in general that I'm kind of looking into more, but... Yeah, we, we're not going to get into his account today about his experience with the medium and his other paranormal experiences. He's had other paranormal experiences that sort of gave him an affirmation about what he thinks about life after death. That's what kind of the conclusion of his messages were. Because he had talked to, to a medium with pretty inexplicable results. That along with other experiences, one of which we're doing in detail today, which is the story of his friend he worked with. I'm a manager in an entertainment complex. Tragically, we recently lost one of my fellow managers due to some health complications. It was random, fast, and very unexpected. We are a tight group and he was my friend. He was also very close to me in age. Immediately afterwards, we began experiencing, quote, activity. Lights acted weird. We would hear weird noises and see things in our periphery. Two nights ago, another manager called me when I was off and what she said shocked me. A random lady in her 30s ran up to an employee of ours in a state of distress and began asking strange questions. She was just walking around like normal when she was approached by our recently deceased manager and he spoke to her, gave her a message to pass it on to his brother and daughter and told her a little bit about himself. Well, that is what she experienced anyways. The dude she was with said she stopped walking and went into a trance for eight to 10 seconds and then came to freaking out about seeing a dead person. They were still there and I live five minutes away so I went up there and spoke with them myself. She knew things about him that were so specific and not well known to many. Also, she only knew what he had told her. So what she knew was specific and detailed and not one single thing she said was incorrect. Now, yes, it could have been a prank, but who would do that and why? We cannot find any reasonable motive for someone to mess with us like that in our grief. Today, as a group, we called his brother and passed the message on. There are so many amazing details involved, but to try to wrap it up, I'll talk about the end of the conversation that I had with the woman. Now, she wasn't a medium, just a random person, and was clearly very shaken. I asked her if she was going to be okay. I mean, if that happened to me, regular life, bills, and work would be over for me. I would never shut up about how I talked to a ghost, and it would consume my life. I was honestly worried for her. Her response floored me. She told me that it doesn't matter because she just found out that she has terminal cancer. She has declined further treatment and will be lucky to make it another three months. She said that ever since, weird things have been happening and she has suspected that she was seeing some people that were actually dead, but he was the first one to speak to her. Wow, yeah. crazy. So interesting how, I mean, I think one of the most interesting parts is that she is near death herself. Mm -hmm. And when she found out, it's like it opened up a shocker or something. Well, yeah, that's, third eye type. That's deal. a super common thing you hear about people right. who are close to death. They're near that transformation period. Usually start that's to like, because they're physically closer. This is almost like a mental. Psychologically. Psychological She's like accepted opening. it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess I don't know if you have a few months left. How? Yeah, you're pretty close. Well, she was at a movie theater. So, I mean, it's not like Well, no, was, there's, there's plenty of stories of people who are terminally ill who start to see months before they die. Right. I guess I just think about it more Yeah, you're thinking like, about like the near-death experience where they're like right at the point of death. Suffering? Yeah, they're like physically deteriorating quick enough to where like their body is yeah. dying. It also could be that it's a 
time issue, the closer you are to your... Yeah, it definitely could be that. But it seems it's almost a mental like, okay, this is happening. Yeah, your yeah. acceptance of your mortality. Right. I've been definitely traveling down the road more of the the near-death experience. I've just been watching all these these videos lately and it, I just feel like I've been kind of pulled in this direction and I'm just, I've gotten a lot of these stories and it's just, it's really fascinating. So I'm going to, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to approach it, but I'm thinking about doing some interviews with some of the more interesting, they're all pretty interesting, but, and then maybe doing like a, another near death episode, maybe an episode. I mean, that probably work too, depending on how it goes. It seems like some of the people I'm interested in, their stories are so involved Mm -hmm. You don't even, you just let them explain it. It's like 45 minutes long. Right. Yeah. So I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to work that into the show, but it's really fascinating. And it's also one thing, the more I listen to it, especially in the world right now, it just seems like things are so chaotic and there's so much fear around everything. It's like when you listen to this stuff more and more, the similarities, it really seems like more and more that this life is is the temporary dream state. Right, exactly. And it's like, that's home. And this place is just an experience to grow and learn. And then, you know, you go back there and you're like, oh, that was a weird dream. Yeah, definitely. It's it's weird too, because I feel like we've all, and I probably, I think a lot of people have been having this experience lately, but I know the three of us have been having really intense dreams lately that are very much, what is the reality? Like it really makes you wonder about consciousness itself. And synchronicity. Oh yeah. I feel like that's really tied to this whole thing too, because it's just, proves like some of them are so profound that there's more than just the physical going yeah. on. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because Daniel makes this point at the end of his message to us. And one day we'll do more in depth his experience with a medium when we do a medium related listener stories. But what he said, it's echoing what you're saying, John, right now with his experience. You know, he had these other experiences like the medium. He's also astral projected, which, you know, well, I've done before, but out of body. Yeah. Uh, he had an astral projection. He said it was not one of these sleep paralysis where something was sitting on his chest it was that pop. It was that the vibration leaving the body. And we've been getting so many of those accounts lately. Oh, it's, fascinating. Yeah, it's just crazy too. And the accounts of these people, yeah. they're so interesting and they're so similar. Yeah, that's the crazy They're so part. profound and life-changing for these people. It really does. It's just like to anyone out there that's struggling right now with everything going on in the world to our Australian friends. Oh, yeah. Take heart that there's more to this than sometimes it feels like this very oppressive world that we're kind of stuck in material prison is just an illusion yeah daniel said quote most importantly all these experiences provided the proof that i needed to let go of my fear of death between the medium and actually experiencing a physiological separation from my spirit and my body i now fully believe that when i die it isn't all over there is more and i will retain my spirit and personality after death it won't just go black and that's so many uh people's opinions who or beliefs Mm -hmm. that have had these experiences i like that he says gentlemen Take comfort in the fact that you will live on. We probably didn't use that inflection, but you'll live <laughs> on after death. Live good lives, and most importantly, love the ones in your life. But don't worry, you will see them again one day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, good message. How, good message. It's like this: the fear of death is the reason for so many problems in the world. And even if you don't know it consciously, there's nothing more horrifying than losing everyone you love and having everything you know never be again disappear. Even though people don't think about it consciously every day, it's buried. And people do all sorts of things to try to hide that. And we don't talk about it in this culture. What's the root of the transhumanist movement too? Yeah. And there's death. so much suffering comes from it. And so I think uh, to kind of explore more of these topics as we go on in the whole, I think could be really helpful to people. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We do a lot of creepy stuff. It'd be nice to do some more uplifting Less stuff. Less soul eaters, more soul, soul continuers. Yeah. There is the good and evil spectrum. Yeah. The yin and yang. Yeah. The Liu Kang and the... Uh, <laughs> Shang Tsung Shang Tsung Liu Kang wins We could mix it up and get away from the spooky stuff for a quick story Sure This comes from Lori And it's called oh, I guess you called it this didn't you yeah. guess Men in Black Among the Bamboo <laughs> Greetings from the frozen tundra of Austin, Texas oh, This was a while ago uh, Surviving the ice storm but have been discussing... That was a while, yeah. Last winter. Yeah. We're catching up on these listener stories, guys. Thanks for hanging in there. Surviving the ice storm, but have been discussing which dog we are going to eat if things get really bad. It would definitely be Norton, the fat one. (laughs) Enjoyed a text exchange with John a couple of weeks ago about meditation and lucid dreaming. Oh, that's timely. And it's nice having a place to share and listen to spooky stories. Any hoodle, just listen to Strange Voices, Trickster's episode. 
I liked the mouse story a lot, and it made me think of something that happened when I was maybe five or so years old. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, in the 60s. At the end of our driveway was a large thatch of bamboo, maybe eight to ten-ish feet square. I used to play in there, and there was a spot of bare ground in the middle where I would sit and play with my troll dolls or read comics or mad magazines that I stole from my brother's room. It was my little hidey hole, and I loved it. One day I was in there, and I looked up and was surprised to see a man standing behind me. Standard black suit, white shirt, black overcoat, and a fedora. He had glasses, and in today's context, reminds me of the evil Nazi in Indiana Jones, or possibly your average men in black description. I don't recall him saying anything, but I knew I was not supposed to look at him. So I looked back into my lap and noticed a small seed pod looking thing, perhaps the size of a plum. I remember picking it up and suddenly becoming creeped out that it may be a bug or something nasty and wanting to put it back down. And that's it. That's the memory I have, no recollection of going back in the house or anything else from that day. No idea who he was, what it was, or if there is any kind of missing time element, but I can say that it was the last time I ever played in the bamboo. I never liked going near there after that. Not much of a story, but a creepy one to me, and I hope mildly entertaining to you. Keep the episodes coming. I am a balladict now. <laughs> See what I did there? Holy balladict. Thank you so much, Lori. Yeah, I just thought there was a, a just kind of a nice, interesting one-off story about a memory you have as a child, being in this bamboo thatch and a man in black, you know, or a man in a in a dark suit, nondescript, and it's a memory that stops suddenly. Yeah, you know, and the thing with the seed pod, just I mean, it could be. It was just a weird guy who came upon her, which is also scary. Just a weird memory that sticks out in her brain from childhood. Yeah. It's weird that when we have memories of being kids, you have these kind of memories. John, I think you mentioned this recently, where you have flashes of somewhere and you just Fragments. figured out where it was. Gatlinburg. Gatlinburg. That happened with you. And that was a synchronicity with our friends uh, Lois and Tyler, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the last things I remember talking to them about before I had had too many Coors Lights. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Uh <laughs> Yeah, that is interesting when you have those kind of flashbacks that awaken these weird memories and then you wonder what other things are kind of kept out, hidden from your brain. And of course, it could just be a guy in a suit that she has this weird memory, walked into her bamboo thatch at the end of her driveway. It's weird it was her driveway. Mm -hmm. And it just reminds me of those places like we all have growing up, your little spot, your hidey hole. We had mom and dad's closet and always felt like there was a magic in there. There was the case of golden silverware in the back. Do you guys remember that closet in the main hallway? That's what we're talking about. Right at the top of the stairs. On Stonewood, right? That would be a great place to hide if you ever... Do you remember hanging out back there? Like you'd go into the back of the closet and then back there's a behind wall. I haven't thought about that place in forever. I didn't know you hung out there too. I didn't know if I hung out there. But but you'd explore it. I've been back there. Yeah. I'm getting really excited thinking about it. (laughs) It is a cool spot. It reminds me of like Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. Exactly. So for our listeners out there, it was a unique sort of the big closet. coat closet. It was big, but then you would go behind it. There was space behind where you would hang the coats, and it would it went up, and then there was like a step. It up. was all carpeted, I think, which was weird too. Basically, just extra storage, but for a little kid, yeah. it was like a perfect little hideout. Yeah, and I found so weird. I found I think it was like an anniversary gift mom and dad got, but it was this big box of gold and silverware. So it was like a treasure. So it was like so yeah, goldenware. This, yeah, this treasure chest. It reminded me, I felt like a pirate or something, like we discovered this, like Goonies. Yeah, no, it definitely had that feel. Can you imagine if we went in there now, like one of us would fit in there? <laughs> <laughs> Just like it'd be like a little seat. Like, ugh. <laughs> let's, let's try it out. Let's get that house, man. Let's anyway, not. that's where the Blue Hole Studio should be. No, it shouldn't. That'd be weird. Yes, it should. Unless we could put like a pool. So I was thinking, where your basketball court used to be yeah. out back? What do you guys out there think about moving into your childhood home to run a business? Wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> That'd be very weird. <laughs> the feelings and emotions that would come from that. I've always it would be very weird. I feel yeah. like you'd overwrite your memories. Yeah, I don't kind want of like to do a hard that. drive at some point. When you think of that house, you'd start painting it over with what's happening now, and you might lose yeah. some of that nostalgic. But you'd also memory. probably recall a lot. Yeah, I would say that's true. That. It would waken stuff up. Maybe we just try to furnish it exactly like it was before. <laughs> that's what I thought. What if, what if we moved in? So weird. What if we moved back in there and we, we were like. Wait a minute. We had another brother. We all Jimmy. remember. Forgot. It's Jimmy. We found like chains in the basement where Dad had like installed a cage. Remember that basement was creepy. Yeah, I love that basement. That was great. The downstairs had a kind of a creepy vibe. Mm-hmm. We're watching Tremors on the couch down there and worried about graboids coming out of the floor. That's how they get you. They're under the goddamn ground. What the hell are they? Some bitches. Benson's. If you're out there listening. DJ and Nick, you'll know them. You guys live pretty much next door. It was the exact same model of the mm-hmm. house, too. Yeah. Good old Stonewall. I used to play Mortal Kombat with Nick. 
Yeah, you were hard to play against. You got so angry. <laughs> I wasn't angry. the best loser. I don't get angry about Mortal Kombat. No, I was thinking of your ping pong matches. No, no. Just competition in general, John. Just years ago. I, I play ping pong all the time now and I don't get mad. Oh, well, I don't get invited. That's because you're not invited. Straight to the point. Special moment. I play with uh, Villers. Oh, that's right. That's right. Good man. Well, I think that's going to do it for today. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your stories. Uh, anyone we didn't get to, there's plenty. There's plenty, and we're going to continue to do these. There's a lot we have and a lot we haven't gotten to. We're going to put these out any way we can. We have an archive on our website um, where you can go check out the stories we've done. We're still adding to that and catching up. So we have a blog form where you can check some of the stories, the details, corroborate events. Sharing is caring. Share them would be awesome, really help us. Yes. And we're going to continue to do this because we've had so many interesting stories and so many compelling cases that I feel like needs to be out there and needs to be shared. We've been talking about doing a book slash audio book developing from the belief hole, which I hope you guys are, are excited about um, now that you've just heard it. Uh, <laughs> we're super excited about the idea. It's a way to really get these stories out there more and use the craft that we do all the time in another capacity to help yeah. spread the whole, spread the show, and share something else with you guys. So if you hear more listener stories coming up more frequently, that's what we're doing. We're trying to get these out more because we want to continue researching topics and we're going to have research-rich episodes, of course, but we're going to tap in some additional listener stories, especially through the spooky season. Yeah. So we can share more of these because these are real accounts people are having and I think it's important to get them out there. Right. So we have some patron thank yous to do, but before we do... Special shout out to Oyvind, by the way, our yes. number one Norwegian fan. Happy birthday, brother. Sorry we missed it. Happy birthday, Oyvind. I still remember his stinger. Oh, yeah, yeah a great stinger. Thing. It's like, ungetak talk, Oyvind. <laughs> you should do the whole Norwegian thing. <laughs> I can't remember thing. what the word was. Well, let's though. drop it right Went here. full Nordic on it. Tusen talk, so you get it off die, Oyvind. <laughs> Thank you so much, man, for supporting the show, for being there since the beginning. Yeah, and for spreading the word so much. Special guy. And shout out to Morton, too. Thanks for reaching out. Hugs from the hole. Happy freaking birthday. <laughs> to our partial ancestor friends. Yes, we are all related from we are the Norwegian Nor line. We are Norwegian. The heritage. Oh, and also a quick shout out to Lois, Lois and Tyler. Tyler. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> we, uh, we, we met up with some uh, fans and we had a great time. Really good people. Fantastic people. I hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys had a good time. I don't remember the end of the night. I don't either. I had a little too many. Apparently we went outside and sat by the water. I remember it all. It was, it was well, good. It's because you're a better adult. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was great to meet you guys. If you guys are out there listening and you're ever coming through Ohio and no guarantee that we'll be available, but feel free to give us a shout out and we'll see if we can set something up. And if up. we ever travel and we need a free place to stay with free room and board, uh, you will let us know and entertain us. And thank you. <laughs> Seriously, thanks guys for being there. Yes, Absolutely. thank you. Oh, quick announcement for expansion members, our prized members of the whole. By the time of this release, I should have made an announcement. So check your email, check expansion.beliefhole.com. If you are an expansion member, uh, we've updated. Oh yeah, this is exciting. A much, much anticipated requested feature, which is the ability to have your own personal RSS feed or link that you can put into your preferred podcast app so you can listen to the expansion episodes in the same app that you listen to the regular feed. Right, whether you use CastBox or Apple, iTunes or Podcast. There'll be a list in the show notes or you'll get an email if you're an expansion member explaining it, breaking down how to do it, but it allows you to basically listen to the show without any interruption. You don't have to listen to it from the website. It can be listened to through any uh, available podcast app that has that feature. So That's exciting. I'm excited for that. Check that out, guys. Yeah, it took a little extra work for us to get that set up, but it's super important. Your listening experience is paramount. Mm -hmm. All right. Now on to our new members of the Believe Hole. John plays this music live, just so you guys know. Actually, I instrumentally. Do. Yep. It's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I love your clarinet work. Our <laughs> <laughs> right. mouth is so sore by the end. Thank you to Spencer Porter. Spencer Porter. Pour yourself a port and join us in the hole. Awesome. Thank you to Denard. Denard. Yes! That is an interesting yes. name. I like it. Denard. Yes. Welcome to the hole, yes. my friend. Yes. Yes. Welcome to James mm. Nanny. Nanny State. Or is it Nanny? Nanny State. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Muppets. How about Friendly Nanny? Lana. It could it be Nanny. James. Lana. Welcome aboard either way, yes. James. Yes. Good to have you, my friend. Milky Way native. Ooh, cool. Yes. Hey, we're all Milky Way natives. That's what you think. Thanks, Milky Way native. Welcome to the hole. Kenneth Tingsotter. Ting Sauter. Ting Sauter. Did I say that right? That's a curious name. I like that a lot. Curious. Awesome. Even has a yeah, he wrote in. It's Scandinavian. Oh, cool. I want to say Swedish. Welcome, Kenneth. Welcome, Kenneth. Good to have you here, my friend. Yes. 
Spencer, Spencer Cummings. Cummings. Spencer Cummings is in the hole. Welcome yes. in, sir. Come on in. Dee Dee Martin. Dee Dee Martin, come on down. Dee Dee, Dee Dee, Dee Dee, Dee Dee, Dee Dee, Dee Dee. John likes that letter. It's his favorite letter, ladies and gentlemen. Michael <laughs> Keith. Michael Keith. Two first names. Welcome to the hole. Welcome Ding in, ding. sir. Special, special friend of the hole. Happy to have you. Vanessa S. Vanessa S. What does the yes. S stand for? Shh, it's a secret. Certain. Yes. T. Certain's with a C. <laughs> no, it's wrong. <laughs> Welcome, Vanessa. Good to Vanessa, have you. Vanessa, super. Good to have you. Lakota Lambert. Lakota Lambert. Awesome name. Lakota is a very pretty name. It's a yes. it's a tribe, right? Mm-hmm. The Lakota people. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Lakota. A beautiful. Goes name. great with the fem- with the female. Riddle be this, Mark. Mark oh. Riddle. Mark Riddle. Welcome, yes, my friend. Yes, Mark Riddle yes. plays his fiddle and eats his curds and whey. And eat plays chess with his father. <laughs> yes. What? I don't know. <laughs> you think with a name like Mark Riddle, you'd play chess with your dad. Oh, because you're like an intelligent figure, yeah. character that's you're, you're like... You're a riddle solver. He's like, Mark, come over John's here. John's never chess. <laughs> chess. There's no riddles in chess. Yeah, but I'm just feeling like people that like gotcha, riddles gotcha. probably are into chess, yeah, too. I, I gotcha. like both of those, so that's accurate. All right, Caden Thompson, welcome in. Caden Thompson. Caden Thompson. Come on down. Welcome to the hole. Let's just stop saying coming down. That's really... Mm-hmm. Come on. It's, no a, one's it's coming kind of like a come on down song, though. It is. You're right. It's like Price is Right. Mm-hmm. Brooke Miera. Hi, Brooke. Oh, Maya. Welcome, Brooke. Welcome, Welcome to the Brooke. hole. Welcome. Thanks for playing. We love you. Ooh, another Kenneth. Kenneth Hunter. <laughs> Kenneth Hunter. <laughs> like no other. Excuse me? This is, a, is that the sound of bow makes? That's not the sound of bow makes. <laughs> like when you pull the bow okay, back? Well, okay, well, I understand kind of what you're doing because like I can see you. Yeah, yeah, it's not the same thing. Not how it goes? Anyway, welcome in, Kenneth Hunter. Uh, Corey Waring. Hello, Corey. Corey Waring. He's boring with us. I think it's... Okay, maybe it is Waring. I don't know. Well, either way, we want you on our side <laughs> yes. in the battle, my friend. <laughs> welcome, Corey. Amanda Bowen. Amanda Bowen. Welcome, Amanda, to the club of special people. You are one of us now. You can never leave. All right, Vincent... Natalini, welcome in. Yes. Welcome to the hole. Yes. Uh, Alex Ketchell. A- Alex Ketchell. Catch welcome, brother. To Alex Ketchell. Welcome into the hole. Dominic. Dominic. Welcome in, Dominic. You make me not sick. You make me happy. You make us well. Just in the nick of t- Dom. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for your oh, brother. boy. It's great to have all of you expansion members in the hole. If you didn't hear your name yet, tune in next week. That was a very abrupt drop of the music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel uncomfortable now. Tune right. in next week to hear your name. Yes. If you've signed up. If hopefully. you signed up. Yeah, we're catching up. But uh, thank you guys so much we're for being here. We're always catching up. We're always up catching up. Everything. <laughs> Just be patient. Be patient. You guys are patient. And you've made it this far. I probably should have said this earlier. Any new listeners, if you want double the content, double the episodes, come on into the expansion and sign up. Like Jeremy said, soon you'll be able to listen to our expansion episodes in your very own favorite podcast app. So yes, sign up. Should be available now for expansion members who yes. are currently listening. Check so it out. Thank you. Thank you to those still at Patreon. You can come over to the expansion anytime. Uh, and to anyone who has neither, we're here to provide it if you want it. Yes. We're always waiting for you here in the hole. We're always waiting for you. All right, guys. Keep it spooky out there. We will see you next time on, on the, the Believe, Believe Hole. Get it? There you go.